Joe, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Great. Uh, great here. Thanks so much for sharing some time here. I've got your uh, background up for uh, folks to refer. I was going to say that's awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs> so Joe Slack is with us today. Now he is uh, he is a board game designer and a board game design consultant. Uh, he's helped more than four thousand designers realize their dream. You can uh, check him out at boardgamedesigncourse.com. He's written the number one international best-selling book, The Board Game Designer's Guide. He also publishes games under his brand, Crazy Like a Box. Some of his credits include Zoo Year's Eve, Kingdom's Candy, Forward Thinking, King of Indecision, and Relics of Raja Vihara. He's also taught game design and development at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. Joe, thank you so much for your time today. Hey Jeff, thanks for inviting me on. So I know you don't do sports, but you know, being uh, one of the uh, gaggle of folks who have been playing these sports sims for years, where you've got these really uh, gnarly <laughs> numbers, uh, driven charts like this, uh, you know, you've got today's games are so much more colorful. I believe uh, this is one of your favorites. If I read that correctly, you know, you get so many cool components out there these days. There's such a, uh, just a new mechanic out there. A lot of new mechanics out there. So, you know, in the interest of trying to, we, we always look about the future of sports sims and it really comes down to mechanics and playability like any game does. But I, I'm really curious about your take on the popular mechanics out there and how you're recreating uh, various historical or human experiences uh, across a broad array of uh, genres and disciplines and topic areas. For sure. Yeah. So with modern board games, I mean, a lot of the mechanics have already been invented. I mean, maybe, you know, 10 or 20 years ago or 30 or 40 years ago, they weren't all there, but over time they've kind of been developed. And uh, what we've seen is from one game to the next, games aren't necessarily like completely off the wall, newly created inventions. It's taking parts of other games, other mechanics, blending them in different ways that haven't been done before, introducing new themes to them, and just doing things a little more innovatively as opposed to uh, cre creating the wheel uh, kind of all over again. But there's tons of mechanics that are, are very popular, including like set collection. So, you know, you get a certain number of things and you get points for them, um, bluffing, and um, uh, worker placement. So you place a worker and you get your thing. Deck building, just kind of building off of, you know, Magic the Gathering and other type, types of games like that, collectible card games. So there's so many different mechanics that can be introduced. So it's, it's kind of our job as game designers to find new and innovative ways to put them together in different ways and with different themes. Interesting, interesting. Uh, well, let's go maybe back to kind of your learning process. You began designing games in 2014. What kind of got you to that point and really got you over that hump to say, I'm going to you know, dive into this? Yeah, so I, I was actually thinking about this recently. The things that I really enjoy as hobbies, I often start to enjoy on their own. And then I start to think, I want to get involved in that. So, you know, I was really into music when I was much younger. And then I picked up the bass and learned how to play it and joined bands. And then I got really into sketch comedy and I had a friend that was that got into a sketch comedy troupe and I wound up writing for their troupe and you know I started really getting into modern board games and I, I was thinking how, maybe I could create one so I've always kind of had that uh, mentality of uh, doing what I'm enjoying as well so uh, I was playing um, a lot of party games at the time with with friends games like Cards Against Humanity and that type of thing and you know the first couple of times we're playing oh okay we're having a great time we're laughing and everything and then you start seeing the same cards over and over again they're kind of trump cards there's then you realize there's not much creativity. You're just, you know, picking a card and playing it, you know, fun at first, but could there be something more? So I started to think, well, could I, could I do something like this, but add a little bit more of the player's own flavor? So I came up with a game called Cutting Linguistics, which uh, introduced uh, different cards that had uh, words on them. And you combine the words and you make your own answer for these ridiculous situations and that type of thing. So um, kind of evolved from there. And then the ideas just kept coming. Uh, from one to the next and you know here i am you know eight years later just designing games full time nice so now what uh roughly is your uh range of services and how do you coach designers throughout the phases of you know concept to market for sure yeah so i have some different courses that i offer i have uh the board game design course which is kind of like game design 101 so that's kind of to get you started 
uh, building your idea, turning that into a, a, a playable prototype, how to play test that, the questions to ask, and then developing it to the point where you're ready to pitch or self-publish. So that's kind of like the starting course. And uh, that also includes something that I really wanted to, to have in my course, because I didn't see it in a lot of other courses, which was the component of me coaching and helping. So we have um, a private group uh, community that people can go in, post questions, talk about their progress. And I was prompt them every week, what are you working on to kind of keep everybody kind of going. And then we have twice monthly calls as well. So the group co coaching or Q&A calls where you can come on and whatever stage you're at, you can ask questions about your your prototype, your play testing, getting ready for Kickstarter, whatever it is. So that's kind of the starter course. And then I also have uh, the creation to publication program, which is kind of like the next step if you're looking to pitch your game to publishers. So how to create sell sheets and videos, which publishers are the best ones to approach for your game, that type of thing. And I run that a couple times a year, a little more hands-on with them as well. And I've introduced as well a crowdfunding success course this year. So for the people that want to do self-publishing and, and go through Kickstarter or GameFound or one of those platforms. So all those courses include uh, videos and um, uh, different resources that are going to help you through step-by-step, -step, as well as uh, the coaching through the calls and the community. And then I also do consulting on the side. So if somebody comes to me and they say, I really, I want to work on my game. I want to work with you more intensely um, and, you know, work on my game very specifically, then I'll do sort of one-off consulting calls. Uh, and I've also done um, some bigger projects for people that are looking to uh, launch their game on Kickstarter uh, with, uh, with another couple of creators. And we call that Kick Restarter. It's often for people who have launched one, maybe weren't successful the first time, and they know, you know, they realize where they're missing something like in the marketing, uh, the pricing, that type of thing. And they need some help to kind of relaunch. So that those are the kind of services that uh, that I offer in my, that I like to uh, help others with. Nice. And now you've worked with uh, a lot of companies here. Uh, you've got a page of some of the titles that you've helped launch. What have been what are some of your most recent launches? And Oh, so for my own games that I've launched? Well, I, I guess both, actually, the games you've launched and games that you've helped uh, get to the market. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. So for games that I've launched, my most recent one on Kickstarter was Montello's Revenge, and it's the expansion for Relics of Rajavahara, which was my previous Kickstarter campaign. So it was a campaign for the expansion plus a reprint on the original. Um, it, it did even better than the original campaign. Um, right now it's being delivered. Uh, most of the games have either been delivered or in the process of being delivered. And then my next game coming out is 14 Frantic Minutes, which is a real-time chase and escape game uh, that's going to be uh, launched this fall. And then for other games that I've helped launch, um, there is Joystick Heroes, uh, which was um, a game that was successful on Kickstarter early this year. And um, I, I'm helping um, some other people like uh, Hafiz Printer, who's a local designer here. He's got a game called Baghdad 1055 that he's going to be launching on Kickstarter next year as well. Um, and... Uh, yeah, lot, lots of other ones. <laughs> Hard to remember them all, but yeah, I've, I've helped. Uh, and then I helped uh, Danny Goodisman also get his Green Skull game, um, uh, helped him find uh, the steps to kind of get a publisher for his game as well. Nice. What are some of your favorite mechanic devices, mechanics uh, these days? You kind of, you know, are you, some of your go-to uh, methods of play? Yeah, I, I, I like difference in every game so i'm not the type of creator some some creators are really good at coming up with one type of thing and just extrapolating that to multiple games and doing it in slightly different ways i i just have ideas and i just break them out and they can go in any kind of different direction so um i love games where there's uh kind of like an action selection so you have four things you can do on your turn and uh this came out really in my game king of indecision because uh in that game you get to do three things on your turn and um, I intentionally try to make it so that it's one less than the number of things you really ultimately would really like to do. So you have to make some tough decisions. So you can move and you can collect and then, oh, I only have one more thing. Do I want to collect this other thing that's here or do I want to offer it to the king in, in the chance that he might change his mind and you know I got to get my offer in there before he does that. So um, I love action selection where uh, people have to make those those tough decisions. They can't do everything. And then there's also... Um, classic things like drafting. There's there's so many different ways to do drafting. There's like Sushi Go and Seven Wonders, how you get a handful of cards, you take one, pass it along. Or Isle of Cats, it's a very similar thing where you get to take two and pass it along. That was kind of a slight innovation on that. Um, and then other things like, you know, set collection is a pretty 
classic one where you're trying to get so many of different things and then you get more points as you get them. Um, and engine building is another one I really love. And it can be done in a lot of different ways, like in Splendor and Century Spice Road, where you're collecting gems or spices. And the more things you get, the more powerful you can you can get, the better you can do things. Um, you know, there's, there's so many uh, fantastic ways to do that. Right. And now when you're working with designers really broadly, what are some of your top tips in terms of kind of settling on a concept, looking at design, choosing those mechanics, going through the phase of design, maybe even kind of what feedback to accept or reject? How do you kind of, you know, stay true to a vision or decide when to jettison something that's not working? Oh, I'm glad you mentioned vision there because I, I feel that's very important. And so I always start with um, the key thing is getting the idea out of your head and onto the table. That is that is the biggest thing because so many people have an idea for something, but unless you actually form it into uh, a game, then it's just a concept in your head. It, it might work perfectly there, but it's not until you get it to the table until you know that, you know, okay, this is flawed. Okay, this is fun. This doesn't work. So I always encourage people to take that idea and make a minimum viable prototype. So uh, rather than, you know, make 500 unique cards with unique art and powers and everything, just make a sample, just make 10 or 20 cards and put them on the table, try it by yourself. See, okay, if I was playing as this player, this is what I would do on my turn and just kind of act it out. So I would play this card, I get this resource, I'm going to move on the board, the next player might do this, and you'll very quickly see the things that are working well and the things that are kind of clunky or getting in the way, and then you can start to tweak and modify that. So it's it's best to try, try that kind of by yourself. And then if it, you got something that's actually at least functioning, you can play it with you know, a spouse, a partner, or a friend, um, just to get it out there and try it. And then, and then the other big thing is getting your game out to all, all different people, so unbiased opinions. So you have to really branch out outside of your friends and your family and people that you know, love you and will just say, oh, this is great because you know, they love you and maybe they don't know games that well, that kind of thing. You need to get it in front of unbiased people, other game designers who will tell you, this is broken, this doesn't work, this is imbalanced so you can make your game better. But you also talked about vision, which is something I really um, encourage people to think about too. And um, I have a document called the 10 minute board game design blueprint, which allows you to uh, document all the kind of starting points of your game. So uh, what kind of theme do you want for your game? What kind of mechanics do you want for your game? What's the end condition? What are other restrictions? Now these things can all change through the course of your game. You might decide, okay, Maybe worker placement doesn't work well for this. Maybe deck building isn't the best mechanic for this. And you can change and modify this. But your vision, what you really want players to feel, what kind of experience you want out of the game, that's what's really key. So if you want it to be a really relaxed experience that people can just kind of chill out and play, if you want it to be frantic and real time and people are feeling tension the whole way through, if you want people to feel smart and clever because they're solving puzzles, whatever that vision is, I really encourage the designer to stick with that and try to hold that through. You'll get ideas from, from play testers and other designers that might take you away from that. And that's part of the difficulty of, of getting feedback is because one person might say, I want more, more uh, opportunities to steal from people. I want less opportunities. So you're going to get conflicting feedback from different people. We have to look at that feedback and say, does that align with my vision? Is this uh, aligning with the experience I want to give my players? Another idea might be really great, but it might be better for another game. So you put that in your back pocket and maybe that'll become another game. Uh, you want to try to stick to that as best as you can, unless your game is just completely not functioning, it's not fun, and then you might want to decide in another direction. Interesting. Well said. Um, so let's maybe dial into some of your preferences or guidances in terms of getting that vision to the board. And, and also, glad you said, you know, how people feel when they're playing the game, you know, really what you're trying to elicit from folks, uh, starting with the kind of gameplay. I mean, are there, is there such a thing as too long or too short a game? Mm, that, that's a good question. And I think it depends on your audience, which is another thing you really want to think about. Is this game going to be for kids? Is it going to be for families? Is it going to be hardcore gamers, casual gamers? Where? So that's going to help you determine, you know, what the length of your game is because a hardcore gamer might be totally into a game that takes three or four hours or more even um, if they're you know really really into that game and 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 it's a really great experience for them and they want to play it all the way through but generally a game like that is not going to sell very well most people are not going to be super interested in playing a game that's going to take up half your day a lot of people only have 30 minutes 60 minutes maybe even less to play so 
You really want to tap into your audience and what they would like from it. And really the game should be as long as it needs to be, um, to be, to be fun. And the other thing I've heard too, and this, this was really an example that was talked about with, uh, with the game Splendor, uh, which is an en engine building game. It's the first player to hit 15 points that triggers the end. And then anybody who else hasn't had a turn gets their last chance to, to get points. And then whoever has the most points wins. A lot of people feel that by the time they've gotten there, they've just got their engine going and they're just able to collect a lot of great things. And they're like, oh, I wish I could do more. or I wish I could go further. Um, so wa leaving people wanting more can be a good thing. Um, if they get to the point where they're like, oh, I've built out, you know, my kingdom or I've built out all my resources as best as I can. And, you know, it's not fun because I've gotten everything I can do. I've kind of accomplished everything. Maybe they won't be so interested to jump back into that game and play again because they feel like I've already accomplished everything I can in this game. So leaving people wanting more is good. Um, if it's a short game, um, in particular, like, you know, 10 or 15 minute filler game uh, that might fit in between uh, bigger, the bigger games for the night or just one that you can play over and over again. That can be really good too, depending on the game, because you know you could play it and, oh, who wants to play again? Oh yeah, let's play again. Or, oh, I lost, but I want Rhyme Redemption, that kind of thing. So a nice short game can, can lead you to playing multiple times over and over again too. So it really depends on your audience and what they're looking for, but you just want to make sure that it doesn't overstay its welcome. And that's something you'll hear back from play testers. And that's a great question to ask is, how long did you feel the game was? So if people are like, oh, that felt like about uh, maybe 20 minutes or something, it's like, well, we actually were playing for 40 minutes. Oh, wow. Like it didn't, it didn't feel like it dragged on, right? Or you can ask people, did this feel too long, too short, or just right? And if you're hearing consistently, it felt just about right, then maybe you're kind of at that right point for your game. Uh, kind of part and parcel then of, of length of play, length of rules. I mean, certainly uh, in the old days of Avalon Hill, you had reams and reams of rules. I mean, and really tiny type things like that. Not to single them out because, uh, you know, just war games in general. Uh, but um, do you have kind of optimal limits for, you know, uh, uh, lengths of rules? Uh, certainly the editing is very important. Uh, quick start guides, uh, visual quick start guides, your guidance is there. Yeah, I think it's always important to think about your rules and how complex they are, because the more complex they are, the less likely your game is going to be played. Because if you've got a shelf full of games and somebody pulls one out and you see this big, long rule book, you're thinking, do I want to sit down and, and learn this right now? Or do I want to play a game I already know? A game with simple mechanics that's, you know, just this is what you do on your turn. You do one thing, then it moves on to the next person. Um, I love games like that because uh, the rules are simple, but then the strategy comes out. You might just do one thing, but you have all these choices of the different things that you want to do. Which strategy, which path do I want to take? So I always encourage people to keep their rules um, as simplified as they can with as least the least number of exceptions, uh, least number of times people are going to have to keep going back to the rules because that takes you out of the fun. Um, so another thing that can help with that is, is reference cards. So if you have a nice little reference card sitting in front of you that says, on your turn, you do these three things. Or here are the different resources, here are the different icons, what they mean. Uh, just a simple little reference that everybody could have in front of them rather than you know one person having to look at the rules while everybody's waiting around. Um, that can be really helpful to just um, refresh people's minds about what to do, especially the first couple of times you play. And it can be helpful to, uh, to think about why people are looking at rule books. Uh, the first reason is because they're learning the game. So somebody has to learn it. Uh, often games are taught by you know, somebody else within the group which is typically the, the best way because not everybody has to learn from the rule book. Um, so that, that's you know, teaching people. And then the second thing is for looking back and kind of clarifying things or remembering things. So you might not have played the game for six months or a year. So you just pick it up. You're like, yeah, we remember all the rules, but how many cards do we start with again? So if you have those kind of things that are very easy, easy like laid out maybe in like the setup, or if, you have, if it's a little bit of a longer game, maybe last page for like frequently asked questions or little reminders, like on your turn, remember to do, th to do this, or these are the phases, or this is how many cards you get. So the more simplified you can have it, the better. Um, and uh, always, you know, with visuals, um, how, how the game is set up is very helpful because you know, okay, I've got it set up, I'm, I'm doing this right, as opposed to just thinking, I think this is okay. And then you get part way through and then realize something's wrong. Um, and then just different examples and visuals uh, to show people, you know, what you do on your turn. An example, you know, 
Uh, Clarice does this on, on her turn, and then she collects these things, and this is how it scores. So you can see nice examples. But yeah, I always uh, encourage people to keep it as simplified as possible, unless you're really going for kind of a hardcore audience that's okay with the rules, uh, because the, the more clear and succinct your rules are, the better. What about, you mentioned that uh, action selection is one of your uh, uh, preferred mechanics. What about uh, uh, randomization of outcomes and the numbers of outcomes, and again, I mean, that's certainly game dependent, but uh, some, you know, guidelines that you have for folks. For sure. Yeah. And there's, there's really two types of randomness. There's the input and output randomness, and I'll probably get them wrong as I'm talking about them, uh, because a lot of people do <laughs> when they're in these interviews, but it, um, input randomness is really uh, like what decisions you're having versus the output is, is what happens. So um, input is, you know, your, your choice into it. Uh, so uh, you might have a market of, you know, five cards, which, when you know, they're going to come out randomly and how do you pick them versus, you know, output, uh, it might roll, roll a die, like in D and D, if you roll over a certain um, amount, you got a hit. If you hit a 20, it's a critical, that type of thing. So um, when you're thinking about randomness in your game um, and, and choice, I think randomness and choices kind of come together. So if you have a market like that, I always like to look at things like numbers between three and five. So if you have a choice of three to five cards to choose from, three to five actions, that kind of thing, that's kind of in the, the reasonable amount of things to ask people to think through and, and make a choice between. If it becomes, becomes much bigger than that, then you can get analysis paralysis or AP, where people are thinking you know, way too hard, taking a long time on their turn to you know, try to parse all these different options, look at all the different things on the board. So the more complex you get, the harder that gets. And if you have too few choices, then it becomes too obvious. Okay, if you're just drawing a card and playing a card, well, there's there's no real choice. There's no agency in that. I'm just playing it through, and this is what happens. And you know, this is why a lot of people, um, you know, are down on games like Monopoly, for example, where you know you just land on a space, you draw a card. Oh, something bad happened to me. I have no choice in this. I I have no control over this. I go to jail, or I have to pay two hundred dollar or whatever. So you want to give players some kind of choice, some kind of option, even if they're rolling dice, like do you, do you want to pick the outcome of the two together, one or the other, have different paths they can travel down, like just giving your players other choices for that and not having just things happen to them randomly. You want, want players to be able to choose. That's nice. In terms of, uh, again, scope and vision, you know, in the sports simulation world, there's tons of homebrews and, you know, depending on the game, you know, people try to add certain flavor as a designer do you allow for that or do you try to design a game that's so fully formed that the user doesn't really need to have that input i mean you can customize anything obviously but you know do you what's your take on you know designing allowing for kind of homebrew rules within the scheme of the game yeah, I think that that's really up to, to the players. I mean, you can't really control that. Once once your game's out there in the wild and somebody takes it home, if they if they choose to do something differently, um, you know, that's that's really up to them. If they if they decide that you know three cards in the market's not enough and they put a fourth one out, or you know they uh, you know the order and something happens done differently, or or people do something uh, simultaneously as opposed to one at a time. I mean, that that's really up to players to decide. Um, I mean, you've given them the game, you've given them the set of rules, this is how you've intended it, this is how you play tested it, and hopefully it plays really well uh, with that, um, but it, it really is up to the players to do that, and you can have different variations in your rules, there are lots of games that have different variants, whether it's to make the game a little bit harder once you, once you start, and you know, you're talking about that a little earlier, I didn't really get into that, but for um, starting setup, you can, you can definitely have uh, a game that's kind of like a starter version, like the first time you play only play with these things. And then once you get more comfortable, you can go to a little bit more of a difficulty level. So you can introduce these other cards, or maybe there's a family version of the game. So Isle of Cats has a family version of the game where you're not doing the card drafting. It's it's a little more simplified. It's just, you're, you're, taking, the, you're taking turns drafting the, the cats directly. Um, so there are ways to do that, ways to introduce uh, new variants where you're doing things a little differently. Maybe the scoring's a little different. Maybe you play a longer game, um, so you can you can introduce those things, but you have to be careful to to not have a rule book that says you can play it 
this way, this way, this way, or this way, because somebody's going to pick that up and they're going to be like, okay, you told me I can play this game four different ways. <coughs> Excuse me. Which, which one am I supposed to do? Um, at the very least, if you say, this is the standard way to play it, and then you can give other options. But yeah, it's it's a it's, it's a difficult thing to to make people decide on that because they've already looked at their game shelf of you know 100 or more games and they've decided, okay, we're going to play this game tonight. And they pick it off the shelf. Okay, we've already made that hard decision. Which which one are we going to play? Open it up. Well, which one of these four versions are we going to play? Like, you don't want to keep making them make more decisions. You know, you're going to get to de decision fatigue and they might say, oh, I'm going to play a different game instead. So yeah, there's definitely ways that you can do that. But yeah, it's, it's really up to people to if they want to do a homebrew. <laughs> Speaking of collections, you've got a fine collection there behind you. Oh, you. Uh, any uh, outside of your own games, of course, what are some of your preferences right now? Yeah, I've, uh, it's, it's so hard when people ask, you know, what, what's your favorite game? What's the game you're playing right now? But um, there are definitely some that I'm, I'm uh, really enjoying. Um, one of them would be uh, Isle of Cats that I've mentioned already. Great game because I, I love Polyomino. Um, you know, maybe you know, going, going back to the days of Tetris, just trying to piece things together and make puzzles. I think we're like a lot of people really like kind of fitting things together and making puzzles and that and the drafting and the different strategies. You can play it solo or multiplayer. So I really love that one. Uh, there's another one called Istanbul, which is behind me, uh, which is a, a great game. It's it's kind of worker placement, but they've put a twist on it where the workers follow you. So you have your workers that come along with you. And every time you move, you leave one behind to collect something and eventually you get to the point where you're at workers. So you have to return to the fountain where you can collect the ball or return to the spaces they're at and get them back one by one. And this game, um, it's the goal is to get a certain number of gems depending on the number of players. I believe it's normally like five gems. And there's different ways to do it by collecting goods and selling them, um, getting coins and buying those gems. So there's just a lot of different strategies. And, and there's also a digital implementation of the game, which is really fantastic. And it gives you a lot of different challenges where you have to win a game under certain conditions or collect a certain number of things in a game. So it gives you a uh, different level of uh, challenges as well and, and things to, to try to accomplish. So those are a couple of them, but uh, yeah, there's just so many great games I could talk about. For sure, for sure. Uh, you know, what about, uh, you, you'd mentioned, uh, you know, uh, video versions. How do you, kind of help people decide if a game is uh more video or if you want to you know port a board game to a more visual kind of a digital video kind of experience do you do a lot of that work and and when when do you kind of you know how do you kind of navigate the mechanics translating those and and the experience of the gameplay retaining that yeah it's, it's a good question because you know the tabletop world and the digital world they can definitely collide um, and there's a lot of games that that have been, uh, you know, successful on both, um, or have at least been in, tried to be implemented in different ways. Um, I don't really get into um, helping people get into the digital world because that's just not my space, and I'm not. I don't really have the expertise. But there have definitely been uh, times, including uh, this past weekend when I was at Protospiel Online, where I was playtesting somebody else's game, and I said this game would work better digitally. Um, you know, it's it's just a little too clunky. Um, um, it takes too much time, but digitally it, it was kind of like Wordle in some ways, um, but with more, more going on and that kind of game would work really well because I know, um, I believe it's Hasbro has made a digit or sorry, a, a tabletop version of Wordle, uh, cause they own the rights to it. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but I imagine it's going to suffer from a lot of the same things because a game like Wordle is very snappy and quick. You put your guess in, it tells you right away what your response is. If you have to have an individual looking at the letters, and putting them in and then making a mistake and then you get down and you're like oh you said there was no e in this and there is any e. like there's just room for error and there's there was definitely in, in this other uh individual's game as well so i think there are definitely times when it can um work better as a digital game and other people have told me too my game relics of rajavahara this would work well as a digital game as well so at some point in the future i may look into that option as well uh, but uh, honestly i don't even know where to get started with that because there's so many you know different companies out there or you can hire an individual to do it but um really not my area of expertise other than just saying yeah i think this would um lend itself to that but i i, I can't really tell you how to go about doing that sure. uh, speaking of the future and uh and shelves shelves of games shelf life how do you decide when a game might need an update i mean you're talking about you know monopoly the classics uh you know don't mess with a good thing or 
provide some of the variants that you say, maybe some folks might want those, but not too many. Do you look at uh, your own games or other games and say this really could use a refresh or maybe a mechanic becomes prominent that you think might suddenly you know work its way backward into a game you know as a retrofit yeah i think we've, we've seen that with some companies there's one great company out there that, that does this really well called restoration games mm -hmm. and they take old classics they take like fireball island um uh, uh return to dark tower and they modernize them a little bit. So they take away like the roll and move mechanics that, you know, used to be in that time and give players a little more choice with cards and that type of thing. So they've done a really good job of refreshing games like that. But um, in terms of, you know, smaller publishers and creators deciding on doing that, um, expansions are a great way to do that. So if, if you have enough of a fan base, then you could introduce an expansion to your game, which adds something different. So maybe players have you know, played the game quite a bit and they're looking for a new challenge. They're looking for something different. So you can introduce something else that makes the game a little more challenging, a little more in depth. And in some cases it might've been something that was part of your original idea. So this, this happens sometimes is when there's just a little too much in that original game. And the, the publisher might look at it and be like, we need to trim this down a little bit. Or the creator themselves might say, yeah, it's just a, a little too much. This is really awesome. But people have to understand the base game before they can really jump to that level. So it might have actually been intended to be in the first version and they have to set it aside and then they can introduce it later as something else that comes along with it. Or even if it's not too different, it could be an expansion that comes along if you are doing say a Kickstarter because you can have you know, your base game pledge level, you can have a base game plus an expansion, which just adds a little more content or something like that. So it depends on the game. Some add more content, which are games like uh, Cards Against Humanity, um, uh, trying to think of other other ones, exploding kittens, games like that that might introduce more um, content, and then there are other expansions that add more mechanics or more to the world. So it just depends on on your game and how that works. And sometimes it even works to make games more in a series. So um, Azul, for example, the one that you were showing earlier on, um, there's now four in that series, and I don't know when they're going to end. I thought they were going to end at three. It's usually like a trilogy to end, but you know they had. Uh, stained glass of Sintra, and they had Summer Pavilion, and now they have Queen's Garden. And uh, the second, third, and fourth might not sell as well as the first one, but I'm sure they do better than the average game out there because they've got that name of Azul on it. And same thing with Pandemic. Um, it was a you know huge, huge hit, and they've come up with expansions and different versions, uh, smaller versions of the game, um, the legacy games that they have three of now. So. It, you know, it, it's definitely, if, if something's successful enough, if you run a Kickstarter and only have 200 backers, probably not room for much expansion there, unless, you know, it becomes a big hit afterwards, you know, a cult following behind it. Um, it has to be have a big enough following because they say that I think maybe 20 or 30% of people that buy your original game may buy an expansion. Um, so you got to look at those numbers and say, is it is that even feasible? To go ahead with that um, you might do better you might do worse than that but that's kind of maybe the expectations so if if that's a very small number 20 to 30 percent of whatever it is your game is maybe it's better to work on on something different instead you know and speaking of variants of course ticket to ride i mean mm -hmm. you know is it worth you know you're 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 coming up with a game. It's almost like writing a screenplay or like a, a television series right i mean you're creating a world uh is it is it useful? Maybe not so much for the um, beginning designer, but when you're coming up with a concept and a vision, uh, is it a better idea to have an idea that something can expand it if you can see the multiple variations or is that not necessarily a great place to start? I mean, if, if it, your game lends itself well to that, then you know definitely have those ideas in mind. You can write them down and, and be testing them and, and trying them. Um, but some games, just it, it, it just wouldn't work. Uh, so you have to really know know your game and know are you just tacking something on to you know try to make some more money or is this actually going to make a better experience? So if if your game is going to make it a better experience, um, introduce new things and get those fans coming back for for more and different variations, then absolutely. Um, I wouldn't focus on those right away necessarily because it really depends on how successful your game is. For you know for all these games like Catan, Monopoly, Ticket to Ride, Azul, Pandemic, you know those are those are big names that have done very well. But for every one of those, there's, you know, probably a thousand games that, you know, have come and gone out of, out of print or, you know, selling off their last copies. So you never know if your game is going to be that next big hit or not. It, it's great to have that in your back pocket in case it does become really big 
and you can make all those expansions and different versions, uh, but you can't necessarily rely on that because, you know, if your game doesn't do very well, then there is no market for that really. Maybe that other idea you have is going to be a spinoff and something completely different. Speaking of market, what kind of data has been accumulated? I mean, uh, you know, Euro games go back uh, well before the pandemic uh, and games, you know, board games have exploded in popularity in the past 20 years. What kind of data is being accumulated and used by designers in terms of, you know, do we want more solo modes like uh, uh, just uh, trekking through history, you know, has the nice little solo mode in here and uh, uh, Wingspan has that solo, you know, the, or the bots they're putting, you know, you, you know, which is something solitaire play for sports games, for instance, has been a huge deal or, you know, dice versus cards or genres. I mean, is there a body of knowledge that's growing to inform designers and publishers about, you know, the future of their offerings? Mm, yeah, that's a really tough thing. I, like we have all the, the data and stats on the market overall, like how, how board games have just been growing, you know, year after year after year, it just keeps going up. Uh, we have the numbers from Kickstarter uh, to see, you know, the successful projects and how much they're raising and how that's changed over time. Um, in terms of different genres and mechanics, it's it's a lot of looking at kind of what, what's popular, what's growing, uh, what's doing well. And to jump on um, trends is, some, is sometimes hard to do because if you see something come out and it's very successful, there, there's a bit of a, pr a process and a timeline that goes with creating a game, getting it fully developed and getting it to market. It can easily be two or three years from idea to getting it to market. Maybe by that time, you know, that trend, uh, that interest has passed completely. So it's hard to, to jump on that unless you see something that's kind of long lasting. Um, so a lot of people jumped on, you know, the adult party games after Card, Cards Against Humanity came out. And, you know, some were successful, but a lot of them, you know, nowhere near that kind of success. Um, roll and rights, uh, for example, are, are popular right now. Uh, there's a lot of them coming out um, and because they're very easy uh, to, to, you know, you can make print and play versions of these. You don't even necessarily buy them. And there have been some creators that have successfully, you know, done ca campaigns with that. Um, but definitely when you're talking about things like solo, we're, we're definitely seeing, um, even before the pandemic, gr uh, solo gaming was was growing. And I think that's partially because some people may be in a community where they don't know a lot of other people, or maybe they're a little more isolated. There's not a lot of game shops, that kind of thing. They have that itch to play a game. Maybe their family members aren't as into it. So they want to be able to play the game. They scratch that itch. So, you know, being able to have a solo version of your game is super helpful. That just adds to your market right there. But it ha it ha can't be tacked on. It has to be well-developed. There's been a lot of games where it comes on Kickstarter, and then a couple of weeks in, you're like, oh, Stretch Goal just opened up. Um, solo version of the game. People are, people have been burned by that because you know they bought the game and then the solo version is nowhere near the same experience. It's just let's just play the game by ourselves and see what score you get. Um, people generally want um, a, something to accomplish, either win or loss condition, as opposed to you know just beating your high score, for example. But you know through the pandemic, that's even growing even more when people are being more isolated. So solo gaming, definitely, if you can have a good solid solo version of your game that plays as well or better than the, the multiplayer version, that's a huge thing games that play well at all player counts that you indicate so if you play say it's a one to six player game it better play well at all those counts if people are like no it's it's terrible at two or it's terrible at five and six it gets too slow and clunky you know you need to cut it down and make it the best game it can be for that particular audience so yeah you have to look at where how the game plays at those different player counts and be, be true to your game make sure that it that it plays really well um for for your audience um, but yeah, I mean, you can look at trends, but I think it's just more being innovative, coming up with new, different things, different table presence, doing things a little different, adding to things that already exist. I think there's having familiarity is really great because people can say, oh, this is just like that other game where you do the drafting this way. There's something that they remember. And then, oh, this is the new thing that they've added to it, as opposed to just all new things or all things you've already seen before. So in terms of your preferences, speaking of solo mode, are you more of a solo gamer or face-to-face? -face? You know, you kind of get in different moods. Yeah, I, I do enjoy both. Um, I mean, when I when I have the opportunity, I think I would take in person with other people because, you know, I like the social aspect of games, um, enjoying the competition or the cooperation um, and, and playing with other people and just, you know, the, the company of other people. So uh, definitely if I have the choice, I, I would prefer that. But, you know, there are times where 
I just want some quiet time or, you know, everybody else is in bed or, I, you know, I just need a little break and want to want to play a game. And, you know, those games can really scratch that itch. There's there's so many great solo games, whether they're games with solo modes or specifically solo only games. Like I think of some examples like Under Falling Skies, Unbroken, Friday. Um, you know, the, these games are, are solo only games. They're just intended to just sit and play. Sometimes those are nice because you can take your time. Uh, if you walk away, you need to get a drink, use the bathroom, whatever. You can do that and come right back to it. You're not holding anybody else up. Um, you can take, you know, as much time as you want. Um, play it, play a game. If you don't succeed, try it again um, and just keep going there. So, yeah, I mean, both both are very um, helpful to have uh, as a as a game designer and to know how to design because you've had that experience playing them. Speaking of that wonderful list of games, what are some of the top games you have on your uh, uh horizon that you've got to get in your collection <laughs> in my collection yeah I, I i try not to um get get too into that because i know so many people who have the the shelf of shame of all the games they buy and and they they can't get to because you know there's there's so many games to get through um but um i do have a, a couple in mind that i'm that i'm thinking about getting uh one is called um oh project l um, it's a polyomino game that you can play solo or multiplayer where you're trying to figure out different patterns, putting these uh, little polyomino tetra C type pieces together. Um, that one looked really intriguing. So I've been thinking about getting that one. And uh, one I actually did back and I'm hopefully going to be getting soon is called The Spill. It's a game by Andy Kim, who's a, a local game designer here. And it's a cooperative game where uh, you are playing as, I think it's like as engineers or marine biologists and there's just been this big oil spill and you're trying to basically clean it up, save the animals around there. And you have to work all together to try to contain this and, and, uh, you know, limit the damage and, and try to succeed in this in whatever kind of limited time and space. I haven't actually played it. I, I saw it at a, at a play testing event and it looked really cool. And I wanted to support my uh, other local designer and friend. And uh, that that's one I'm really looking forward to getting soon. I, I don't know if you sell any of your games or you kind of have a rotating cast, but are there any games you've really regretted letting go? I can't say so. I, I, I tend to hoard a little bit when it comes to games. I don't uh, I don't purge my pile as, as much as I should, but I do have a, I do have a stack that I'm trying to sell right now, just games that I haven't played in a while that I don't think I'll really come back to just because maybe other games have kind of replaced them or just don't play as much as I used to, maybe when I was first getting into gaming. Uh, I can't think of any that I've, you know, given away or sold that I'm um, upset about, to be honest. I, 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 I keep most of the good ones and sometimes have a hard time getting rid of the others, even if I'm like, I haven't played in a while, but maybe I will. What are your uh, top five desert island games, if you will? Oh, okay. Yeah, if I was stuck on a desert island and I have to, to take them with me. Oh, man. Okay. Am I by myself? Um. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's going to make a big difference because sure. they have to be soloable if, if that's the, the case. Um, I think one, I probably have to take a deck of cards if, if you count that as a game, just because it's so versatile. You can do anything with a deck of cards. You can make your own games with a deck of cards too. And I have. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that would be one. Um, I think I'd have to take Isle of Cats. I uh, just love the challenge of that. And it's a great solo game. Um, Under Falling Skies, probably right now. Um, it's a great solo game where you play. It, it just feels like, Kind of like Space Invaders and Independence Day with these aliens coming down and having to make these tough decisions um, and has all these campaigns. So it's very replayable. Um, so that would be one of them. Um, uh, probably, I'd like to say Cartographers, probably. It's another game, uh, kind of a draw and write game. Lots of uh, versatility in that game and, and very fun to play and not, not a long play time. I think that's four. So, oh, my number five, probably I have to say Maquis. Yes, that would be, it's a great solo worker placement game where you're playing um, in the French resistance, trying to resist the Nazis and, and sabotage them and that type of thing. Uh, great game with all, all different types of missions, especially with the small expansion that came with it, gives you even harder missions to try to accomplish. So yeah, that, that's another one of my favorite solo games. Excellent list. Excellent list. So lastly, what is next for Joe Slack and his, uh, game design career uh you know you number of students you look to uh influence uh expanding your course offerings uh, uh you know games you're uh working you'd like to launch in the near you know, the distant future some just general concepts 
Sure. Yeah. I've, I've just been thinking about this because I'm realizing how much I, I want to try to accomplish before the end of this year. And <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be launching my next Kickstarter, which I'm really looking forward to, the 14 Frantic Minutes that I mentioned, the uh, cooperative chase and escape game. So that's going to be coming out. Um, we're aiming for October for that one. So that's the, the next big one on the game horizon. Got a lot of other games on the go, which I'm always excited about, but that's the kind of the next one to launch. And then in terms of um, helping students, I'm going to be uh, relaunching the creation to publication program in September. So I'm going to be opening up enrollment for um, students that want to come in and get their games pitched to publishers and get them signed, helping them out with that and uh, hosting um, an event called Perspiel North. Uh, I'm uh, one of the co-hosts co of that. So that's going to be an in-person game design event whole weekend long. That's coming in November. And the last thing would be uh, my board game design virtual summit. So I've hosted these for the last two years. I have a, I always have a, a great lineup of game designers, publishers, rule book creators, content creators, all different people in the industry. Um, I interview them and have other opportunities for people to listen to those interviews, do some play testing, interact with each other. Yeah, so really looking forward to toasting that for the third year as well. Awesome, awesome. Joe has been super insightful. Thank you so much. It's a boardgamedesigncourse.com. I will put that link in the description and uh, check it out. If you have a, a game that's kind of knocking around and you'd like to get it out, Joe's your man. Oh, thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate it.